inspiring and have these times and places on Saturdays. Welcome to Saturday Praise. If, uh, if you're wondering what Saturday Praise is all about, uh, Saturday Praise is a time and a place where you can be inspired to become a deeper lover of God and a better lover of others. Which is easier? Hate your enemy or love your enemy? Naturally, which is easier for you to do? Hate your enemy, love your enemy. By the power of God, it could be easier for us to love our enemies than hate them. That's what grace is all about. And you come every Saturday, grace. We can all grow together. We can be transformed together. We can become actual followers and disciples of Jesus Christ. We're not simply attenders of a service. We're not simply participants of a, of a program. But we're actually learning. We're actually growing. We're actually being changed into the likeness of Jesus. Somebody said, Our love for God is measured by the love that we have for the person whom we love the least. I'll say that again. Our love for God is what? Is measured by the love that we have for the person whom we love the least. Who's the person you love the least? The person you hate the most. And that gives you a clue as to how much you love God. Wow. That is very revealing. But by the grace of God, you don't have to stay there. By the power of God, by the grace of God, and by the Holy Spirit, He can so change us that we want to love as Jesus loves. We are now on the sixth part of our series. We're talking about grace, the good news about grace. And uh, last week, we talked about four words that define what grace is about. Actually, the closest. And, and that will be God is for us. God is not only with us, but God Himself is with us. God has so many reasons to be against us. Is that right? We have done so many things, and God is not supposed to be with us and for us because of our sin, but because of His love, of His grace, of His character, because of who He is, God is for us. So we've looked at saving grace. We've looked at sustaining grace. We've looked at liberating grace. We've looked at uh, healing grace today. We're going to look at offering grace. What is offering grace? This is extending grace to others. Why is that? Because God doesn't want you to be simply a recipient of grace. He wants you to pass it on. He wants you to pay it forward. Whatever it is you have received from God, God wants you to give it to others. So if you have been blessed by God, He wants you to bless others. If you've been cared for by God, God wants you to care for others. If you've been forgiven by God, He wants you to forgive others. Here in Matthew chapter 8 and uh, chapter 10 and verse 8, let's read it together. Give as freely as you have received. What is this grace? God wants us to share with others. Particularly, I want to talk about the forgiveness and the compassion and the mercy we have received from God. Because that is what we receive more than anything else. How do you extend the grace of forgiveness to others? How do you share it to others? There's a lot of thinking about forgiveness today. Many people, many teachers, they say many things about forgiveness. And actually, there's a lot of myths. There's a lot of misconceptions. And with forgiveness, for a lot of people, they have watered it down. It's so watered down, it doesn't have any meaning anymore. So, let's take a look at what forgiveness really is. What is it? Before we do that, we'll have a test. We have lots of quizzes. This past Saturdays, five questions. True or false? Okay? 
Five questions, true or false. This is not the thing you're going to be graded on. So, uh, if you got the wrong answer, you can cross it and make it correct. Write down, true or false, what you believe about this, this statement. Okay? Number one, a person should not be forgiven until he asks for it. True or false? A person should not be forgiven until he asks for it. Number two, forgiveness includes minimizing the offense and minimizing the pain it has caused. So what is forgiveness? True or false? It includes minimizing the offense and minimizing the pain it has caused. Number three, Forgiveness includes restoring trust and reuniting a relationship. Meaning, forgiveness is being reunited. It's being together again. True or false? Number four. You haven't really forgiven until you've forgotten the offense. If you still remember it, you haven't forgiven. True or false? Number five, when I'm forgiven, I'm also free from the consequences of my wrongdoing. Because I've been forgiven because I've been pardoned, and there's consequences to what I've done, I'm also free or released from the consequences of my wrongdoing. True or false? Okay? You ready for the answers? If you were to take the Word of God and you were to particularly read through the Gospels and read about what Jesus said about forgiveness, the conclusion is this. All of the five statements, they're all false. Not one is true. Okay? All false. You can change your answers. Okay, one by one. Forgiveness, do you have your outlines with you? If you need a pen, raise your hand. Someone will help you with a pen. Okay. Do you have to repent? Do you have to ask for forgiveness before God forgives you? The answer is false. Forgiveness is not what? It is not... Conditional Forgiveness is unconditional. In other words, based on some kind, it's not based on some kind of condition. The Bible teaches the opposite. It is not something you earn. It's not something you deserve. It's not something you work for. It's not something you buy or bargain for. It is not something you get as a part of a bargain if you promise to never do it again. So you make a promise, God, I won't do it anymore. And as a, uh, as a gift to you, God forgives you. No, it is unconditional. So, when you tell a person, I forgive you if, that's not forgiveness. Again, when you say, I will forgive you if, that is not forgiveness. You're bargaining. You're not forgiving. Genuine forgiveness is con conditional. It's offered even if it is not asked for. You were not even thinking about it. You were not even asking for it. But it has been offered. When Jesus hung on the cross, what did Jesus say on the cross? Father, Father what? Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. No one deserved His forgiveness at the cross. Nobody had bargained or bargained for it. It was an unconditional offer of pardon. Okay? Number two.
It is not minimizing the seriousness of the offense. So when you forgive, you're not saying what happened is okay. When you forgive, you're not saying that everything's alright. You don't minimize the seriousness of the offense. You're not saying that's no big deal. Kaya ko na walang problema yun. Okay lang yun. It really didn't hurt. Don't worry about it. It didn't hurt me that bad. The truth is, if it's worth forgiving, it did hurt you. Hindi ka naman pala pang nasaktan. Hindi, pa't mo pang patatawan eh. If it's worth forgiving, okay, it did hurt you. It did cause pain and you don't need to minimize it because that's not a part of forgiveness. Forgiveness is saying, yes, it did hurt. Yes, it did cause pain in my life, but I'm going to let it go. I'm not going to count it against you. Please remember this. When you forgive, you're not forgiving the crime. When you forgive, you're not forgiving the offense. When you forgive, you're forgiving the offender. You are forgiving the criminal, you are not forgiving the crime. The crime remains evil. The crime remains bad. The crime remains wicked. So you don't forgive the crime. You forgive the person who committed the crime. So the crime was not alright. The crime was not okay. What happened was not something you don't have to worry about. It was evil. So we forgive the offender and not the offense. Once there was a story of a person in the newspaper, there was a man who killed his father, his mother, and his brother. Now if you go to that person and you say, Hey brother, it wasn't such a bad thing. It's not a big issue. It's not a big deal. I proclaim you forgiven. That's insanity. That is crazy. It was a big deal. So forgiving is not saying it didn't hurt when it did or it's no big deal when it's actually a very a very big deal. We have to understand there's a difference between being wronged and being wounded. You know the difference? Being wronged and being wounded. Wounds, many times, they're unintentional. Wrongs are intentional. You're wounded all the time by people accidentally. A lot of people don't mean to hurt you, don't mean to harm you, but you get hurt. Do people say things that hurt you that they didn't mean to say? Pero magana. They didn't mean to hurt you, but words came out of their mouth. For a lot of things that happen to us that wound us, Many times, what is needed is not forgiveness, but simply acceptance. Here comes a person, you don't want how he smells. And they say, oh, I forgive him. The person didn't do anything to you. You don't know where that person came from that smells good. But you say, I'm offended by how he or she uh, is meant. I forgive her. Forgiveness is not needed in such situations. In such situations, more often than that, what, what is needed is acceptance. Recognizing that we live in a world where people are different and we live in an imperfect environment and, uh, and we live in a place, in a time, in this planet where you're going to hurt many times unintentionally. Forgiveness needs to be reserved for the real stuff. 
for the serious things, for the things that are intentionally hurtful, people need to harm, that's what you reserve forgiveness for. Severe ridicule, hatred, prejudice, abuse, whether it's verbal, whether it's emotional, whether it's physical, when people abandon you, when people forsake you, when people betray you, when people hurt you with all the passion of their beings. That's what you reserve forgiveness for. Let's say you don't like the way I dress. And maybe the way I dress offends your fashion sensibilities. I don't need your forgiveness. I need your acceptance. And a lot of pe people in your family, they don't need your forgiveness. They need your acceptance. On the other hand, if someone hurts you intentionally, you've been seriously wrong, that's what you need to forgive. And whenever you minimize a wrong and you say, it's no big deal, don't worry about it, it didn't hurt, you cheapen forgiveness. That's why statement number two is false. Forgiveness is not minimizing the pain. It is not minimizing the offense. Number three. It is what? It is not resuming a relationship without change. Forgiveness is not the same thing as reconciliation. It takes one to forgive. It takes two to reconcile. So to forgive and to reconcile are two different things. You can forgive a person without you actually getting back together. You know why? Because it's possible that the person you need to forgive is already dead. Like somebody hurt you when you were small. Somebody neglected you when you were growing up. And that person has caused so much pain in your life. But today that person is dead. But you still have the hurt, you still have the resentment, you still have the bitterness. You can choose to forgive. And when you forgive, it doesn't mean there's a restoration of the relationship because in that case, it is no longer possible. So it's one thing to forgive, it's another thing to be reconciled. Forgiveness is not the same thing as rebuilding or restoring a relationship. Forgiveness it's instant. You, you declare it from your heart. You make a choice. And as far as you are concerned, you have forgiven the one who offended you. But trust, it takes time. Trust has to be rebuilt over time. So there's a big difference between forgiving a person and trusting a person. You can forgive a person and you don't have to necessarily trust Him. Somebody asked money from you and said, I will pay you. This, uh, I will pay you when I have money. And he got his money, didn't pay. Okay? Then he, he asked for money again when he was in need. And he said, I will pay you when I have money. He got his money, didn't pay. You can forgive the person, but you really have to trust Him. When it comes to, when it comes to borrowing money and being able to pay as He has promised. Forgiveness simply takes care of the damage. It's letting the person off the hook, but it does not guarantee that the future relationship is going to be right. Those are other issues. It takes more than forgiveness before, it takes more than forgiveness for reconciliation or for, uh, for being reunited. Three other things. If you want to have a restored relationship with someone, first comes forgiveness. Now that's your part if you've been hurt. But if there's going to be a reunited or reconciled relationship, there has to be a repentance, there has to be demonstration, genuine repentance,
restitution where and when possible. And there has to be rebuilding trust, and this takes time. So in a relationship that has been harmed or damaged, if you've been hurt, forgiveness is the part you have to do. When you are the one who has been damaged or hurt. But they have to show some other things to show that repentance and restoration has taken place. I hope we can see the difference. For example, you've been in a relationship where you got married to an alcoholic. And, uh, and uh, the, the spouse is abusive and they really hurt you over and over and over again. And this person comes home and, and this person says, I'm sorry, will you forgive me? And you say, yes, I forgive you. Because God commands us to forgive. Forgiveness is instant. Forgiveness is a choice. But if they say, now will you let me back in the house? What will you say? You'll say, that's a different issue. We need to have some progress here first. You need to get some counseling. You need to develop a track record to show there's some genuine change. Because if this person batters his wife, hurts the kids, and is a danger to the family and to himself, and he wants to be back in the house, even though you have forgiven the person, that person doesn't necessarily have to be taken in. Because the best place it's possible, the best place for that person is to be in a... Uh, in a... In a uh, Rehab, where he can learn, where he can grow, where he can deal with his issues. Just, so just because you've forgiven the person, it doesn't mean you will allow yourself to become a mat again when it comes to the relationship. So what forgiveness is based on grace, trust is earned. Big difference. If somebody offends you over and over and repeatedly, in the same way continues to hurt you, you are called by God to repeatedly forgive the person. But you're not obligated to instantly trust them and act like everything's fine and they can come home and things go on as they have in the past. It is not resuming a relationship without a change. That's clear? Okay, so forgiveness is not the same as being reunited. Number four, forgiveness isn't what? It's not forgetting what happened. Some of you may have a hard time with this. A hard time forgiving because you think, I can never forget it. And if I forgive, I'll have to start the relationship again. That is not true. But since uh, we have this song, Forgive and Forget, and we have this movie, Forgive and Forget, and people say, uh, you have to forgive and forget. And it's like they're saying, if you have not forgotten what happened, you have not actually forgiven. That is not true. This cliche, it's very popular. It's so sweet and nice. There's only one problem with it. You can't do it. And it doesn't work. It's impossible for you to forget everything that's happened. Actually, the more painful, the more painful something is, the less likely you're ever going to forget. The deeper the knife wound, the harder it is to forget it. So let's think about the logic of it. Okay? Logic. Is it possible to try to forget something? Is it possible to try 
to forget something. And and be successful. So your hands. Have you forgotten it? And as soon as you try to answer it, you remember it again. The whole time you're trying to forget, what are you focusing on? What you're trying to forget. So, forgive and forget, and you want to forget what happened, and you're trying to forget, and the more you remember it. It doesn't work. It is not possible. You cannot forget something by trying to forget it. It doesn't work that way. The only way you forget something is by replacing it with something else. Scientists have proven that our mind is like a giant warehouse. It's like an archive with, lots, with, with thousands and thousands and thousands of cabinets. So what really happened to you in the past, you don't really forget it. It gets filed in the warehouse of your brain. And the more important an event is in your life, the more likely you're going to remember it. Pag mas mahalaga yung pangyayari, mas maaalala mo kung ano yung nangyari. Now, you may block some things out. Okay? You may try to suppress or repress some things out. And trauma may cause you to erase some recall of events, but they're still there. You're not just remembering them, but they are still there. And if surgeons will take a probe and open up your brain and stimulate like certain parts of your brain, what's gonna happen is they can bring back the colors, they can bring back the memories, the smells, everything that happened in that instant. You don't really forget anything. It's in there. It has not been erased. It is still there. Now, some of us think when you forget the crime done against you, when you forget the offense done against you, we think that spiritual maturity. Finally, I'm spiritually grown. Because what happened to me in the past, I don't remember it anymore. That's not spiritual maturity. That's amnesia. <laughs> okay? Amnesia, spiritual maturity, not the same. But we think that is spiritual progress. When, when am I going to get to the point that I'm so grown up in Christ that I forget the painful things in life? We're asking the wrong question. When am I going to be so mature that I forget the things I feel so guilty about, I feel guilty over and the things that other people have done to me? I'll say it again. The truth is this. You may never forget them. But there's something better than forgetting. Might be thinking, whoa, so I'm, I'm hopeless? I will never ever forget what happened to me? There is good news. There's something, something really better. And what's that? You ready? It is remembering, but not feeling the pain. It is remembering, but without the bitterness and the resentment. It is remembering even clearer as to what really happened. But you now remember it without this, this desire for vengeance, without this without this negative emotion of wanting to kill the person if you see him face to face. So, you remember what happened, but how do you remember it now? You remember, but now you see how God worked in it anyway. You remember, but now you can see how God brought good out of the bad. You remember, but now you see how you grew in character. You remember, but now you see how it changed the direction of your life. You remember, but now you see all things work together for good to them that love God and to those who are called according to His purpose. You remember, but now you remember it believing that had it not been for 
for that event, you won't be the person you are now today. All things work together for good. And that's even better than forgetting. Imagine you forget what you forgot what happened. If you forgot what happened, can you praise God? What will you praise God for? You didn't even know what happened. You don't remember what happened. So your opportunity to magnify God and glorify God and grow in your character and have a change of direction and be the passionate disciple that God wants you to be, it's all lost because you've forgotten. You've forgotten what happened. When I remember something and I remember what God has done in spite of that, then I really thank God and I praise Him. So forgiveness is not forgetting because you probably never will forget. Number five, it doesn't what? It doesn't remove the consequences of the offense. Many people don't understand that forgiveness does not remove the consequences. When a woman takes drugs all her life, okay, and then she gets pregnant, what's the result? What happens to the baby? The baby is addicted to crack cocaine. And the mother may say, Dear Jesus, I have sinned, I have failed you. I want your forgiveness in my life. And, and, and the woman gets a new heart and a new spirit. The person becomes a new creation in Jesus Christ instantly, but the baby is still a crack addict. Or uh, the person who goes and lives his life and says, I'm going to go out and live my life the way I want to. I'll go to bed with anybody I want to. I will live a totally immoral life. And then this person comes to Jesus. Lord Jesus, I have sinned. I have been wicked. I have been evil. I receive your power in my life. I want your forgiveness. Cleanse me from all my sins. And instantly, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. But they might still carry a sexually transmitted disease. They still might die of AIDS. So God forgiving you doesn't mean the consequences are taken away or are removed. A person who leaves his wife or his or her husband and and the children and has an affair and breaks up a marriage and then later comes to God God I have sinned I've done wrong I want your forgiveness I was stupid I was selfish I shouldn't have done it I was wrong gets born again receives the power of God in his life but it does not remove the scars that come from breaking up a home, the scars on the children, the scars on the spouses, and all the others. There are consequences. So real forgiveness is not some cheap term. It's okay, don't worry about it, I forgive you. It's not some cheap term you just throw out and instantly everybody gets to feel better. It is reserved for, for sins, and it is reserved for the person of whom they were committed against. So, all the statements, false, 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 false. What is real forgiveness? If that's what not forgiveness is, then what is it? Number one, what is forgiveness? It is rather remembering what? How much I've already been forgiven. So when you forgive others, when you extend grace, when you extend mercy, 
when when you've been blessed by God and you share this blessing to others, what does that mean? It means remembering how much I've already been forgiven. Okay, let's go to Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 32 all together. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other just as in Christ God forgave you. What does the Bible say? You're not forgiven because you've earned it. You're not forgiven because you deserved it. You're not forgiven because you promised God, I'll never do it again. That's not the basis why you've been forgiven. You're forgiven because God is a forgiver. And you experience the forgiveness which has always been in the heart of God through faith. So God forgives you. Why? Because He is a forgiver. And you get to experience that forgiveness. How? Through faith. This is the reason why the Bible says, For by grace you've been saved through faith. For by grace you've been forgiven. And through faith you experience it. If you don't feel forgiven, you don't want to forgive anybody else. You don't want them to feel it, that's for sure. If you're hard on yourself, guess what? You're going to be hard on who? On others. So if, you're, if you don't feel forgiven, you don't want others to feel forgiveness. So the starting point is with you. We have to experience divine forgiveness. And the more grace we receive from God, the more gracious we're going to become to others. So when you're not gracious to others, what does it mean? You have not really received, you have not really, you've not really allowed yourself to experience a lot of the grace of God. The more forgiven you feel by God, the more forgiving you're going to tend to be towards others. You know the woman uh, who opened the, the bro broke the alabaster uh, box and everyone was saying, uh, what awaits? The money should have been given to the poor. And, and, uh, and uh, Jesus said, lighten up. This woman, she has been forgiven much so she's giving the most love. She'll be remembered from this day forward because of her actions. It was an act of worship. Because she felt so graced by Christ, she was being gracious. She was being gracious herself. So it starts, forgiveness, it starts with remembering how much I've been forgiven. All of us have been forgiven a lot by God. Okay, that's the first one. Here's number two. What is forgiveness? What is genuine forgiveness? It is relinquishing my right to get even. Relinquishing my right to get even. Romans 12, 19. Never what? Avenge. So the Avengers, they're not biblical characters. Because the Bible says, never avenge yourselves. Leave that to God, for He has said that He will repay those who deserve it. So, He says, don't try to get even. Don't try to retaliate. Don't seek revenge. Leave that to God. You say, if I forgive, that means I give up all my right to get even. And that's exactly what forgiveness is. You give up, you give up your right to get even. You absorb the pain, you absorb the hurt without you having to retaliate. And you say, that's unfair. You don't know how much he hurt me. And now I'll give up my right to hurt him or to hurt her. Forgiveness 
It's not fair. Who said forgiveness is fair? You don't deserve forgiveness. You deserve justice. Aren't you glad, glad God does not give you everything you deserve? What we're enjoying right now, or the blessings we're enjoying right now, we don't deserve. Not one breath of air. Not one particle of food. Not one ray of sunlight. Not one day of our life. We don't deserve anything we are enjoying. God is so gracious to us, it's not fair. It is not fair. But God still is gracious to you. He does not give you what you deserve. And, and since God is gracious, He wants us to be gracious to others. So you say, you give up your right to get even. Why do we do that? Leave that to God, for He has said that He will repay those who deserve it. Life's not fair, but God will take care of His own. God will take care of everything. God is going to close the books one day, and He's going to balance the ledger. He's going to balance everything. Is going to right the wrongs that we see. And sometimes you do see justice in this world, but there's a lot of times you don't see justice, but God is a God of justice. And we can leave that up to Him. God will handle it. He does. And He will do a perfect job. What is genuine forgiveness? It's really, it's what? It's responding to evil with good. How do you respond to evil with good? Luke chapter 6. Let's read it. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. And pray for those who mistreat you. How can you tell you release somebody already from your desire to get even. How can you tell when you've genuinely forgiven others? How do you know? This is how you know when you can pray for them. Not the prayer that Lord Taman Samson and Kibla. Okay, not that prayer. But you ask God, God, I pray that he or she will experience the kind of God you really are. That he will know or she will know your grace. So you can pray for God to bless them. When you come to the point when you can actually pray, Lord bless that person who hurt me, you'll know forgiveness has taken place in your heart. When you can look at their hurt and not just your own. Let me say four words. Hurt people. Hurt people. Hurt others. You get that? People who are hurt. People who are hurting. Okay? Hurt people. They hurt others. We hurt other people because deep inside, we're also hurting. If somebody hurts you, it's most likely they're hurting on the inside. So the one who hurt you, if you have this spiritual lens, you will see inside, they are in so much pain. And they deal with the pain by hurting others. When you have gently forgiven a person, you can look past the ways that they've hurt you and see 
how they're hurting and how that hurt is part of the reason they've chosen to hurt you. Okay? So when you truly forgiven, you can go past your hurt and you can see the hurt they have in them and how that hurt is being used to hurt you back. Out of their hurt, they begin to hurt others. When you can look at their hurt, you can genuinely know. You, you've genuinely forgiven them. But while you're still preoccupied with your hurt and what he or she has done to you, you have not forgiven them. But when you have allowed the grace of God to so work in you, and you're able to go past the hurt they've done to you, and you can see their hurt and what's happening to them, and you get to say, I wonder where he or she has been coming from. And now you're trying to understand the person, and you start praying for that person, that God will bless the person. Forgiveness has taken place in your, in your heart. When you can pray to God to bless them, when you can do good to those that hate you, when you can bless those who curse you, you're responding to evil with good. You say, how can I ever do that? It's impossible. I can do that to that person who's hurt me. And you can Unless you do one thing. What's that? Allow the love of God to penetrate every fiber of your being. It's a very it's a very simple principle. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Whatever is abundant in your heart. That is going to come out of your lips. That's going to be revealed with your life. So it's very important that you imagine the grace of God, the love of God, the mercy of God, the compassion of God, the unconditional love of God. Imagine it's like marinade. Okay? So marin you marinate your whole being in the infinite love of God. Full immersion, total saturation, nakababad ka talaga sa pag-ibig, sa pagmamahal, sa kahabagan ng Diyos. And you let this love of God penetrate every fiber of your being. Okay? So when you get squeezed, what's gonna come out? Whatever it is you were married in. Pag, pag inilubog ka kasi, ibinabad ka sa suka, ano, nagbiga ka, anong larawan? Maasin, no? Uh, kung minsan siguro, yung iba sa atin, nung napaptize, suka yung ginamit. Kaya lagi maasin yung mukha. Kailangan, ma-immerse ka sa matamis na pag-ibig ng Diyos. Ano? sa masarap na kahabagan ng Diyos, mababad ka doon at kayaan mo ito'y manood sa bawat himaymay ng iyong katauhan. Kapag ito'y nanood sa buong katauhan mo, kahit anong mangyari sa'yo, mapiga ka, mapisa ka, masunto ka, ang lalabas sa'yo, Panginoon, patawarin mo sila, hindi nila alam ang kanilang ginagawa. There's only one way. You have to be immersed in the unconditional love and mercy and compassion of God. Here's what the Bible said. 1 Corinthians 13, 5. What does it say? Love. Love keeps no record of wrongs. So husband and wife. Big argument. The next morning, the husband in the office told his friend, Last night, my wife got historical. His friend said, don't you mean hysterical? No, historical. She told me everything I've ever done wrong. <laughs> Do you ever do that? You get record of wrongs and when you fight, 
you review all the wrongs they did in their life. And the Bible says, love keeps no record of wrong. It doesn't mean you forget the wrongs. It means you don't use them as ammunition. You don't count them against the person. So you remember the wrongs, but you don't use the wrongs against the person. It means you don't pull them out and use them to retaliate and hurt the other person back. Love keep no keeps no record of wrongs. What most of us like to do is forgive me, hurt, but we want to hold on to it also and then stop piling. Okay? Naka warehouse. Naka archive. Later on, if we do something wrong and get accused and they say, you did this. Then we can say, but you did this. Okay? You know what? Eight or nine. Then you don't even know the dates. You have a journal. Right? Of what they did and how much they hurt you. The Bible says when you do that, you're not being loving. You're being hateful. And you're showing that you have not allowed yourself to be immersed in the grace of God. There's a fourth thing about genuine forgiveness. What's number four? Okay, it's repeating the process as long as necessary. You do these things. How often? Over and over. Forgiveness is not one shot event. It's not a one time deal. How long do you have to keep forgiving a person? You do it as long as the feeling of revenge keeps coming back. So you go back to one, two, and three. Okay? One, two, and three. If the desire to retaliate keeps coming back, you repeat the process as long as necessary. So Peter asked a question. Peter asked, Lord, how often should I forgive someone who sins against me? How many times? Seven times? Seven times? Seven. No, Jesus replied. Seventy times seven. Uh, Peter was thinking, he was already saying something very impressive to Jesus Christ. Imagine. The Jewish law said you had to forgive a person three times. No more than three times. But Peter said, Lord, seven times. And Jesus said, no. Seventy times seven. The point is this. Infinity. As long as it takes. Until you let go. Until you let go of the resentment. Until you let go of the bitterness. You have to keep forgiving that person. Until the pain stops and the desire to get revenge, it goes away. Dear Jesus, okay? You say, I know this bitterness is bad for me. I know I need to forgive them. Lord, I forgive that person. And five minutes after, you want to kill the person? Okay? You have to say it again. When the memory comes back, you just go to God, God. I want to remember how much you have forgiven me. How I, I want to remember how much you have been so gracious to me. So you don't try hard to forgive. You keep coming back to number one. How God has been so gracious to you. Remember how God has forgiven you. You don't deserve anything. But God wakes you up every morning. You don't deserve anything. But God gives you every breath. Which you're taking every day of your life. You don't deserve anything, but God blesses you anyway. So you keep on remembering how God has been so compassionate to you. So you have to say it. You have to repeat the process as long as necessary. It's got to be continual. It's a process. Now you say, I've forgiven them. Why do I still hurt? You've asked that question? I've declared with my mouth, I'm forgiven. The person. Why do I still hurt? You're still hurt because it has not happened yet. You have said the words. Okay? 
but it did not happen yet. You've got to keep forgiving them. You've got to keep coming back to number one, God, I release my bitterness. I release my hate and my desire for vengeance. I receive your grace. It's, it is not advisable when you do this. You go to the person, hey, I forgive you. And then you want to kill the person after one day, then you go back to that person again, hey, I, I forgive you. And each time you go to the person and tell him, you're forgiving the person. This is between you and God. You go before God and say, God, I'm releasing this bitterness and this hate and I'm releasing this desire for vengeance. I want your healing grace to be a part of me, O oh God. There could be reasons why you're not supposed to go to the person and tell the person you're forgiving the person. They may never knew it happened. They may not even remember the event. Or maybe they are dead. That's what we have talked about. There are many reasons why sometimes you cannot even go back to the person and ask their forgiveness in person. So, it's not something you have to do in person. You can use your sanctified imagination. You can get an empty chair. And in your mind, as you, as, 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 as you ask for the grace of God, before God was a God, in the past, I've been hurt, I've, I've, I've been abandoned, I've been forsaken, I've been betrayed. And uh, on my own power alone, I cannot forgive. I don't have the ability, I don't have the power. But by your grace right now, this hate I am feeling towards this person, I now release by your power. I'm letting go. I'm setting him free. I am releasing him. I'm not going to bring it up again. I'm not going to hold it against him. Not because he deserves it, but because I'm doing it because this is what God wants me to do and I'm letting it go. For some people, what helps them, they write a letter, but they don't mail the letter. But what happens is, they're able to get it out of their system. You keep asking the question, why, why in the world should I forgive that person who hurt me so much? You have no idea how much they hurt me, and you're right. I don't have any idea how much you've been hurt in the past. But why forgive? Okay, last. Just straightforward. The wages or uh, the punishment 
is eternal separation from God. How many times have you rebelled against God? A lot of times. Now imagine you have a bank account, a heavenly bank account. Okay? And each time you sin, it's like a check that has to be in cash. And because of our sins, what happens? We dread it. Right? Because the bank calls us and the bank says, insufficient funds. Right? Everything we do and whatever we do, there is nothing we can do that, that can take care of our sins. Now here's the question, how did God deal with our debt? Did He overlook it? We have this statement, okay, and uh, it's grossly overdrawn. Did God burn the statement? Did God ignore our balance checks? Would a holy God do that? Could a holy God do that? He won't or else He will not be holy. Did God punish you for your sins? Are you now eternally separated from God right now? No. You're actually enjoying the presence of God. You're actually enjoying the love of God. But you have rebelled. How come you're enjoying all these? Through Jesus. All of your sins since you got born. All of your sins yesterday, today, until you die. All of these sins were counted against Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ died for them all. He also paid for our penalties. If you're overdrawn at a bank, a fine must be paid. If you are overdrawn with God, a penalty must be paid as well. The fine of the bank is a hassle. But the penalty of our rebellion is eternal separation. But Jesus has not only balanced your account, He paid your penalty, He took your place and paid the price for your sins. He changed places with us and put Himself under that curse. God has been gracious to us. What God is asking you to forgive is a dollar. But the forgiveness God has given you is in the billions. The person who hurt you, that's one sin, two sins, five sins. But our sin against the Creator, it's unimaginable, but still God has forgiven us. Here's another reason why we have, why we need to forgive. The alternative is what? The alternative is bitterness. Let's go to uh, Hebrews chapter 12. Let's read it together. Be careful that none of you fails to respond to the grace which God gives. For if He does, there can very easily spring up in Him a bitter spirit, which is not only bad in itself, but can also poison Poison the lives of many others. So, like your children, like your husband or your wife and others, let it go. Uh, you know what nitroglycerin is? What is it used for? What is it for? Dynamite, right? There was this guy who was annoyed with someone because every time they talk, this person would do this. You. I don't like you. Okay? And, and he hates the person. So what he did, he got a bottle and put a string and put nitroglycerin in it. And one day his friend said, what's that? And what's that hanging around your, your neck? Oh, it's a bottle of nitroglycerin. It's very... It's explosive material. So why do you have that on your chest? Because there's this guy, when he talks to me, he always beats me on my chest. So I want to hurt his finger. <laughs> so 
So when he does that, it will blow off his finger. But what really happens? When the person does this on his chest. Yes, the finger is blown off, but what happens to him? His whole chest gets blown. That's what resentment does. It does more harm to you than the person you resent. There was another person. Uh, if, if you remember our statement, forgiveness is to release. Forgiveness is to set a person free, right? Only to realize that the person that is set free is who? It's you. A former prison inmate said, The guard at the gate of a prison is even more confined than a prisoner. How big is a cell? In the United States, it, it's quite spacious. How big is the tower of the guard? It's like this. The prisoner can lift weights, can jog around the oval, he can rest, he can do relaxing things, but what about the guard? Always watching, always on the alert. Cannot relax one bit. The prisoner said, the guard at the gate of a prison is even more confined than a prisoner. The prisoner can relax, but the guard has to be constantly alert. You might object and say, yes, but the guard of the prison gets to go home at night. And that's right. But the guard of the prison of resentment never gets home at night. So the only, the only uh, alternative is bitterness and it's, and it's not good. And here's the last one, why we have to forgive. It reveals what? It reveals how much we allow God's forgiveness in our lives. We receive what we give. Okay? We receive what we give. Here in Matthew 6.12, let's read it together. Forgive us our sins as we want. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who have sinned against. Let me just say, stay here for a few minutes. Our last point. God forgives us not because we forgive others. God forgives us as we forgive others. Confession does not create forgiveness in the heart of God. The forgiveness has always been there. Confession simply allows you to experience the forgiveness of God. The grace of God forgives you, but your faith allows you to experience the forgiveness of God. Why this prayer, forgive us our sins as we forgive those who have sinned against us. It's a very, very simple principle. It's like God sending you to the market. And God sends you to the market to purchase your neighbor's groceries. Can you imagine this? God says, go to the market and whatever you get your neighbor, you get also for yourself. For whatever you give them 
is what you receive. So you go to the market, if what you get for your neighbor is what you get, what will you get for your neighbor? Huh? You'll get the best. Okay? Because whatever you get for your neighbor, when you open your refrigerator, that is what you're going to have. You will be experiencing the treatment you've been giving to others. So, what kind of hamburger do you like? What kind of ice cream do you like? What kind of vegetables do you like? What kind of fruits do you like? What kind of stuff do you like? You like the best, you like the fresh. So you buy the best and the freshest and, and the goodest for your neighbor. Because whatever you buy from your neighbor, that is actually what you, what you bought for yourself. Now, imagine your neighbor trash your front yard. Like this trash, did not take care of it so much, there's this big one and all this trash went on yours. And you mention the mess to him, and he says he'll get to it sometime next week. And he said he's got work to do, so he cannot, so he can't, uh, so he cannot take care of it. And uh, and he says, don't be, and he says, don't be so picky. It will work as a fertilizer to your garden anyway. So the garbage remain in on your front lawn. So you grumble and mumble your way to the store and then it hits you. I'm going to get even with this bomb. So you go straight to the grocery. You because God says, get him groceries, right? So you go to the sardines, you go to the tinapa, you go to the beans, and you go to the skim milk, and you go to the rotten vegetables, and you go to the to the stuff that really, really don't taste good. And you go, uh, you know he doesn't like opera, so you get the opera. Huh? You imagine what is it he doesn't like. So those were the stuff you got, okay? And... Uh, you pass by the double chocolate ice cream, you pass by the, the really, really good bread, and you got the moldy bread, and you got all those stuff, and uh, you're chuckling, yes, I'm going to get even with my neighbor, so you drive back to the house and drop the sack in the lap of your lazy, good-for-nothing neighbor. Have a good dinner, you said and you walk away. But after all that, you got hungry. After your brilliant scheming, you were tired and you're hungry. So you go to your refrigerator to fix a sandwich, you open the refrigerator, what do you find? Everything you bought for your neighbor. Your pantry is full of what you gave your enemy. Treat me as I treat my neighbor. That is the greatest principle in the Bible. When you say, Father, forgive them, or when you say, Father, forgive me as I have forgiven those who have sinned against me, what are you saying to God? Give me what I gave them. Treat me how I treated them. God allows you to experience how you have treated others. Some of us have been eating to yoke for a long, long time. And you're already what? Tired of it. Your spiritual experience is not Pizza Hut, super cheesy, supreme. What are you experiencing? To yoke? In the morning, to yoke? Nothing wrong with to yoke, but it's to yoke in the morning, to yoke in the uh, lunch, and Evening to you every day to you every week. Why to you always? Because that's what we've been giving to others. Start treating your neighbors. 
God wants them to be filled. And that is the spiritual experience you are going to have. Your diet is not going to change until you change. Your spiritual experience will not change until we change treating others differently. You look at other followers of Jesus, they're not as sour as you are, they're enjoying the delicacies of God, and you're stuck with, with dillies and opera and uh, moldy bread, and you've always wondered how come others are so happy, and I feel so friendly, maybe now you know. Could it be God is giving you exactly what you're giving someone else? So maybe change what you're giving others. And before you know it, you have such a wonderful, delightful, desirable Christian experience. Yes. Would you like a change of men? It's up to you. Okay, and we start with number one. Let us remember how God has been gracious to us. Amen? Amen. May you truly have a blessed, really abundant, really life-changing and transforming week ahead of you. Start serving your neighbors with what? Whatever you want to see in your refrigerator. Okay? But you say it's impossible. How do you do that? Go back to God. How did He treat me? How did He love you? How did He forgive you? And that is the beginning of a genuine forgiveness for you. I'd like to invite all of you to stand please wherever you're sitting right now. We'll say a prayer to God and sing a song, a truly powerful song. Let's bow our hands. Our great God in heaven, Thank you for reminding us today that the good news is not that we have been forgiven, but that you are a forgiver. You are the best news for me. You are a God who does not change towards us, and you are a God who is with us, and will always be there. Thank you for grace, which we not only can receive, but we can give to others and extend to others. We want to extend grace to our children. We want to extend grace to our family members. We want to extend grace to our neighbors. But we cannot do that without being immersed in your love. And we want to do just that, Father, today and every day. We declare with our lips that, our love, that your love for us is unconditional. We declare with our lips that you love us with an everlasting love. And now, Father, we want to sing this song to our belief and our commitment and our conviction that through Jesus Christ we truly are forgiven. May you be honored, may you be glorified in Jesus' name.
Father, I just pray for each one this morning. Whatever each one is going through, whatever their challenges are with them. I pray, Lord, that the Holy Spirit will just be so close with each one. So I need each one. So that whatever the struggle is, whatever the challenges are, you are there to strengthen. You are there to empower. You are there, Father, to be the hope to all of us. Father, we pray for our family members who are not here. Wherever they are, we pray that they will also experience your grace. We pray, Father, that you will grow. We will not so that you will develop to your glory. So that we may extend this grace you have given us. And many more lives will be changed. Many more lives will be transformed. Many more people will be drawn closer to you. Thank you for bringing us together today. Thank you, Lord, for having blessed us so much. We give you back all the glory and all the honor. Thank you for answering our prayers. All these, the blessed name of Jesus Christ. And everyone say, Amen. Let you know that 3.30 as is, same po ang service natin.